Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, we have a very exciting webinar that we're presenting on how to start your crypto fund the right way. My name is Chris Meter. I am Executive Vice President at Firmidium. Firmidium are a fund administrator um, focused on private funds, um, servicing hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds, and we have a number of funds that have a crypto focus. With me on the line, I have Gary Ross from Ross Law Group, and I have Patrick Colgrave from Forbes Hair. Um, let me turn it over to Gary and Patrick to give a quick introduction of themselves and their firm, um, and then we'll kick off. Gary? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Very happy to be here. Very happy to be uh, joining Chris and Patrick on, on this. Uh, we understand that the timing is kind of uh, interesting here, giving it after last week. Ross Law Group is a corporate and securities law firm in New York, and we concentrate on fund formation and the regulatory matters that come out of that, and also helping structure cross-border investments. We've been in the crypto space since 2015, doing crypto funds and SPVs and the like since 2017. So, and I'll mention back in the very early days, it was mainly Ron Paul libertarians and the like, and no one was getting rich back in back in the <laughs> early days. Sometimes. Those days. And, Great. Uh, uh, very happy to be here, Patrick. Great, thanks, Gary. Yeah. Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm Patrick Colgrave. I'm, I'm a partner at uh, Forbes here. We're a Cayman BVI law firm. We're full service. Uh, I'm on the corporate and fund side. We do a lot of crypto work uh, covering crypto funds, both in the open-ended and the uh, closed-ended space. Like Gary, we've been involved since the uh, very early days, and it's been really interesting to see how the space has developed. Great, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Gary. Um, so before we kick off, I just wanted to give the standard disclaimer. Um, the information we're about to share is for informational purposes only. Um, it does not constitute legal or ad any legal advice or um, or advertising. Um, this does not establish a relationship between you, Ross Law Group, Forbes Hair, or Formidium um, while viewing these materials. Also as well, there is a there is a Q&A um, box within your chat. Feel free to send any questions. We will, um, we will give some time at the end for Q&A. As well, we'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the call. And if there are items that are relevant to the topic we're touching on, we would touch on those as well. So feel free to send them over. Um, we do have about 130 people who reserved, so we're excited for that. So thank you all for joining. And we have a number of items to get through. Um, I will sh first share the agenda with you. You'll see there are a number of items we are expecting to get through in a short period of time. Um, so why don't we just kick it right off? So the first item I wanted to talk about um, was the, just overall investing in digital assets, um, speaking to the types of investments. We're not going to touch on all of these, but um, Gary, maybe maybe I can turn it over to you to start to kind of talk about, I, I think most people are familiar with the coins, the tokens, a little bit with NFTs, but what are some of the things that we're seeing um, we're seeing come out that are maybe a little bit new or or that have changed since since you started with 2017 um, working with digital asset funds. Without question, it's the yield farming and Web3. So with uh, uh, that and DeFi, because it used to be really just investing in when uh, people started looking at these as a more of a money generator thing than cutting out the Federal Reserve. Uh, people were looking at tokens uh, almost exclusively, whether they were called coins or tokens. Most crypto funds were just investing in SaaS, which we'll talk about in a bit, Simple Agreement for Future Token for a uh, uh, get a convertible kind of a claim on a future coin issuance. Uh, but without question, the last couple of years, the yield farming aspect of it has been really important, at least for um, for our practice. Interested That's in hearing Patrick's, uh, Patrick's thoughts great. on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you uh, there, Gary. We, we're still seeing a fair amount of activity in the open-ended space, which uh, is investing in your uh, traditional, if you like, um, crypto and coins and trading those. But for us, what's been really thematic over 2022 has been this move into, into VC and the interest in the uh, crypto VC space. And 
predominantly what those funds are looking at is the underlying protocols, investing into those, also investing, as you say, uh, into, into yield farming uh, in terms of themes. Uh, DeFi is very strong, in, uh, you know, with what we're seeing. Um, so, yeah, I think from our perspective, the one thing that's jumped out to me has been this move into VC and the amount of interest that we're seeing on the GP side in, in establishing VC funds. And I agree on the administrator side as well. I think, uh, you know, back in the day, a, a crypto fund was somebody that was owning coins or someone that was owning tokens. Um, now that's a very small portion of the portfolio. I think anybody in a retail world can generally go and buy coins and tokens. Um, so most investors are looking for more sophistication. I agree. We're looking, so we're seeing much more, um, I guess, what we call out of exchange or out of custodian trading and activity that happens. And those obviously present their own unique challenges um, as an administrator to get independent. But um, that's where we work closely with our clients to understand. And then I have some items around why invest. I think it's, you know, I think most of them are obvious. Many people on the call will recognize the main reasons people are investing. Um, you know, uh, again, I think it's 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 to get exposure to that crypto. Some of it may be driven by just investor demand as well, but I think it is leading to diversification. It it, it does provide a bit of a hedge. Um, that's I suppose is debatable, um, but it, but the view is that it's supposed to provide some type of hedge against inflation. And then, of course, always the as we hear from many, the fear of missing out. Yeah, I think the number one thing there is portfolio diversification. To me, that's yep. why uh, that's what makes funds attractive. Uh, a lot of people who are uh, starting starting funds, at least in our experience, are people who have a history in the crypto world and the like. And then a lot of the investors are people. Some are super sophisticated, you know, and have been in it for a while. But and then some really like are kind of dabbling in it a little yep. bit. The investors Agreed. and the like, and they don't yep. really have. Uh, they're really relying on the manager to uh, have a uh, uh, to have a good a good a good diversification of, of uh, uh, digital assets. Correct. Yeah, and we're seeing that as well. We're seeing some of the traditional managers who are starting to enter into that space, either you know not necessarily by launching a, a truly digital asset or crypto fund, but maybe by adding a crypto component to their portfolio. So we're we're seeing both that we're seeing TradFi managers you know, launching new funds that are focused in it, as well as we're seeing some that are adding a component to their existing um, portfolio, so. And then I think the, ne the next thing we want to touch, oh, sorry, went too far ahead. Um, USA and outside of USA. So obviously, Gary, you, you work, you're a US-based lawyer. Patrick's a non-US-based lawyer, but you guys work together closely on clients, and many of our clients are I assume many of your clients have both U.S. and non-U.S. entities. So, um, what are the, some of the things that you know impact when investing from the U.S. or you know maybe that decision of investing outside of U.S. that you're hearing from clients? Obviously, the investor demand drives that. I assume non-U.S. investors are looking for non-U.S. funds, but I know there's other rationale as well. Um, what are you seeing there? Typically, if they're okay with just investing from U.S. Ex exchanges, then they're really, if they're doing kind of a straight long, if they're doing a straight kind of long fund to kind of buy and hold of various uh, tokens, other digital assets, then if they're okay with kind of uh, Gemini and Kraken and these other ones that are really just available in the or that are available to U.S. persons, then they're really looking at just holding a small number of assets. Then they're okay with kind of holding four or five digital assets, something like that, as opposed to if they're looking at like 30 or 40 or something like that, for something like that, they really, I mean, uh, I, I would think, Patrick, uh, I would think that they would be looking at offshore simply because in what I would consider the more legitimate U.S. exchanges, there really aren't that many tokens there. And yep. we can go into in a bit the whole idea of whether they're securities or not, whether it's smart to treat any securities as not uh, to treat any tokens as not securities. I would submit at this point it's it's not smart at all. Uh, but uh, the exchanges like Gemini and the like, I think they are still only trading like 15 coins and the like. So mm -hmm. really, the the folks who are okay with the U.S. exchanges are really are normally they're focusing on a small number of of assets and a small number of assets. And I mean not just purchasing and holding. I mean I just said long, but I should also include the staking 
in there, the yield farming. You know, you can buy it and then hold it and then you can stake it there. You can do that in the U.S. on, on some of these. Yep. And Patrick, in your experience, you seeing other other kind of reasons? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is an interesting question because, you know, as an, as an offshore lawyer, came and BVI lawyer, how I tend to think of this is, um, you know, uh, are you going to be setting up a U.S. fund or are you going to be setting up a um, BVI Cayman fund? And I don't really want to speak to this uh, too closely because it's at a very basic level. But, um, you know, from the investor perspective, do you set up in the U.S.? Do you set up outside of the U.S.? Uh, really speaks to where are your investors coming from? You know, are they non-US investors, are they US investors, are they tax exempt, are they taxable US investors? Now, um, you know, Gary can add a bit more color to this, but certainly from an offshore perspective, we see the offshore component coming in where you are looking at um, non-US and US tax exempt investors and you wanting to fundraise from them. Uh, I guess the other thing I just want to mention is I spent a lot of time in Singapore and 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 uh, working in the Asia market, and, and here we are uh, working with uh, managers who have no nexus uh, to the US, and, and typically uh, what we would see these managers doing from an exchange perspective is, is focusing on your uh, non-US exchanges, so, um, you know, Binance and the like. However, that's not to say they won't have, um, you know, won't be trading on, on, on the more traditional exchanges, if you like, like uh, Kraken and Gemini, but there again, they, they're trading on their uh, non-US component. Uh, so they may have more exposure to uh, to assets uh, on those exchanges. Great, and then and then as well, getting that exposure to those assets, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, typically in a hedge fund world, uh, you know, a lot of people are setting up master feeder funds with maybe an offshore feeder and onshore feeder and a, I mean, an offshore master and onshore feeder and an onshore offshore feeder. Um, are there other things that people are doing to try to um, try to, you know, address the account opening of a for for non-US exchanges, perhaps? Is it simply being done through a Cayman entity or are there some other things that are that are happening? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question, and I think that's, you know, one of the most topical questions at the moment is uh, how do you how do you open an account if you uh, a US based fund on a on a non US exchange and different th th there's different iterations of that and, and, and people are taking different views. However, what we've seen and, and, and this is not just us, but seems to be a move in the marketplace is um, really trying to um, uh, distance as much as possible the entity through which the trading will be done that will have the account on the non-US exchange. And what that uh, typically looks like is setting up an offshore uh, special purpose vehicle. Uh, that special purpose vehicle will have a, a facility agreement uh, with the fund uh, in the master feeder context or um, uh, where you have two side-by-side -side funds, you, you, you may have a back-to-back -back facility agreement. So you may have mm -hmm. a arrangement entered into between the offshore entity and the special purpose vehicle, and right. then a, a separate arrangement, back-to-back -back arrangement between the US entity and that offshore entity, just trying to uh, create that distance. Um, so yeah, it, it requires uh, a, de a fair bit of thought. Uh, you need to think through the issues. Uh, there isn't a perfect solution in my mind at this stage, and a lot of it will come down to uh, disclosure as well, making sure you've got the proper disclosure in your offering documents. And Gary, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that perspective, because you would be seeing that in the in the US uh, fund offering documents. Some folks say, hey, my uncle lives in France. Can we, uh, mm -hmm. can my uncle see, you know, have a sole member uh, uh, limited company there? And then can we use that? Can we kind of funnel, for lack of a better word, money from the US fund over to my uncle, and then my uncle does all the, the trading. And while that might work, and, and I'll just for the audience, for Binance and some others, usually they're looking to make sure there are no US directors. 
no U.S. officers, no U.S. stockholders, and no U.S. ultimate beneficial owners. So usually that's what we're looking at, and that's why we're talking, we're having this conversation here. So the idea of kind of somebody over there who's, you know, getting money not through an equity investment, but through some sort of loan or something could work, but then we have to disclose that in the offering memorandum. And that can look really bad in the offering memorandum if you have sophisticated investors. Now, if you have your college buddies and it's a small fund and something like that, maybe but and then uh, you, you know we see many times i'm sure we we all do where a fund starts small and then next thing you know they have kind of uh, it grows and grows and grows and you start having some lps who are really questioning what's going on there and the idea of kind of sending it to someone's uncle in france to do all the trading just seems like a huge risk and it's too much of a risk so uh generally that we're going to prefer something like patrick said setting up an offshore uh, setting an offshore entity and, and entering into a credit, um, some sort of credit facility. Great. Yeah, and I, and I think you raise a good point there, Gary, which um, is worth um, reiterating is making sure that certainly on the offshore side, you don't have any US persons involved in the governance of those uh, of those entities of that special purpose vehicle. So you would have non-US persons as your um, as your directors in that instance, and and potentially you would consider that also uh, with respect to the offshore fund, if you if you're using a corporate vehicle, just to create as much distance as you as you possibly can. Yeah, and we're I throwing guess around the, the term. You are... Sorry, Jim. Uh, yeah, sorry. Is, um, Go ahead. The, as far as the ownership of the of the special purpose vehicle is concerned. Uh, we're setting those up as orphan vehicles, so those would be held through a Cayman Island Star Trust, um, where the uh, shareholding is 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 held by the uh, by the trustee, which is a uh, a Cayman trustee. So that would satisfy the beneficial ownership aspect of any uh, reps and warranties that need to be given. And I assume, Patrick, you all handle all of that for your clients, correct? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, we, we we do the legals. We've also got the corporate services uh, aspect and the and the trust license as well. So so we do the formation, uh, set up the structuring and the legals, working closely with um, uh, with U.S. counsel like yourselves, Gary. Yeah, I was going to mention that one kind of wrinkle in U.S. law is that there's actually three separate definitions of U.S. person. So there's not kind of one overriding one that everyone looks at. There's Reg S. There's a, a tax definition of U.S. person, and there's a CFTC definition. There's a commodities definition of U.S. person. So uh, when I first started doing this work, I would wonder where people are getting the U.S. person definition. I was like, this does not match reg ass. And a lot of times people just have a kitchen sink. They'll just name everything, you know, the, the tax definition and all of that, just to make sure people are marking no and that there's no way whatsoever they can be considered a U.S. person. Because the one for reg ass is not necessarily the overriding one here great so i think the overarching message is, is make sure you have good legal counsel to help you structure this <laughs> so that you can if, if you're looking to invest outside the u.s using some type of u.s entity right so all right next thing i wanted to talk on a little bit about uh crypto fund strategies um so i think from our side we we see the list here um we have clients that touch on all of these um as mentioned i think originally you know Five or six years ago, crypto fund was trading in cryptocurrencies. Right now, it, it's it's trading in everything. Right, so they're trading in DeFi. They're doing yield staking. They're doing farming. They're doing you know a, a lot. They're trading in NFTs. They're trading in a, in a lot of different items that we're seeing. So I guess is there you know while we still see some of these strategies, it becomes very blurred. Um, is that a, is that overall what you guys are seeing on your side, or is it are you still truly seeing funds falling into one of these categories? No, I, I agree with what you're saying, Chris. I mean, it's it's really, there's a, a, a diverse range out there. And, um, you know, as as the space matures, so, so, so do the iterations of um, uh, strategies and funds that are coming to the market and, and the terms attached to those. So, um, I don't think I've got anything really to add to what we've got on the slide and, and what you've said previously. Right. I'll yeah. just mention that one one of the one of the 
things that came up a couple of years ago when people first started doing staking, we would get questions from clients. Do our documents allow us to stake our digital assets? And, you know, when they had launched the fund in 2017, 2018, Yield farming and staking was not on anyone's radar. It was not on most people's radar. And uh, we had to look at the documents and be like, no, actually, you know, we didn't mention that because it wasn't really there then. And then uh, we had to decide, well, is the language in here sort of broad enough where we can do it? Or do we need to go back to LPs and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Do we need to get consent or is just notice okay and the like? So that's one of the challenges of this space. Being mm -hmm. particular or, or being descriptive in the offering memorandum, you're offering documents wherever you put it, subscription agreement or a separate OP, being descriptive enough to let people know what you're doing so they don't sue you later and say, hey, you didn't tell me what you're doing. And yet opening uh, and, and allowing for sort of the flexibility in the space, knowing two years from now, if we're given this presentation, some of these are going to be different and there's going to be new things on there that aren't that aren't on anyone's radar right now. Right. And I think those old, you know, the old mantra of, hey, let's write into the document that we can do whatever, you know, here's our strategy, but we can do whatever we want. Um, that may seem to work, but, uh, you know, again, it's important to involve your legal counsel because there may be additional risk disclosures or other disclosures that we really need to, you know, that, that we'll need to make sure are covered and not just, you know, that the trading strategy itself is covered, but, you know, do we have the risks outlined def definitively and uh, other items that need to be adjusted in the PPM? Mm -hmm. Um, we did have a question that come in um, that's kind of related to this a little bit, so I, I'll move to it. Um, do U.S.-based asset managers have to personally be offshore, or can they be U.S.-based and lever leverage that legal structure of an offshore vehicle to access offshore exchanges, et cetera? Um, Patrick, I'll let you answer on that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. and. Uh... Uh, we see certainly where the uh, sponsors are US based, the investment manager will invariably be um, domiciled in the US and managing both the offshore and the onshore fund. Uh, the question then becomes, you know, what do you do with the uh, special purpose vehicle if you set up a special purpose vehicle to uh, open up the uh, non US exchange account and, and trade through? Uh, through that account. Certainly your direct is assuming that they are uh, uh, professional, independent uh, directors will not be willing to make those investment decisions. So there will need to be some sort of investment advisory arrangement between that special purpose vehicle and, uh, and the US base manager. Um, it is possible to set up a, um, uh, we, we, we would see this in the BVI, a BVI approved manager, which would be set up specifically to enter into the arrangement with the special purpose vehicle and that BVI approved manager would itself have a, um, a sub-advisory agreement with the US manager. So that's just interposing another uh, element, if you like, distancing the US element by one uh, further step. Uh, however, the majority of these structures that we've seen uh, would just be an arrangement between the US manager and the um, special purpose vehicle. Okay. You know, there's a cost element. You can structure as much as you like, but you've got to bear in mind that there's a cost element to the more detailed your your structuring that you uh, that you do. Great. I'll and, chime and, in. And, 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 I was just going to ask that that BVI manager entity as well. That doesn't people don't need to be physical. They don't need to move to BVI, correct? They can, no, no. Create, they can no, no. create an investment manager company and yeah, right. Uh, okay. That's right. I mean, the beauty of a BVI approved manager is there's no economic substance issues yet. Uh, they may come, but at the moment there aren't any economic substance issues. So, yep. so um, you don't actually have to have boots on the ground uh, from you know from a sponsor perspective. Great. I think BVI is still recovering from the uh, big hurricane a few years ago, right? Uh, it's doing okay. I haven't been there since uh, the hurricane, but I hear things have moved uh, along a fair bit, which is good. Okay. Yeah, I was going to add that under the Reg S definition of U.S. person, if you're just in the U.S. and you just 
open up a Cayman entity or open up an offshore entity, you're still going to be considered a U.S. person most of the time. So just keep that in mind when you're going through this. The look through don't allow for it to be that simple. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, Gary, that's right. And and that sort of feeds into the um, uh, uh, thing we mentioned earlier, which was uh, there, there, there isn't at this stage, certainly not in my mind, a perfect solution to this issue. Um, you know, you do what you can, and 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 that's that's where we stand. Great. All right, moving on to fee structures and valuations. So, you know, I think people are likely familiar with standard two and twenty fee structure that we see in hedge funds: two percent management, twenty percent incentive. Um, you know, generally subject to a high water mark. Is that what we're seeing in crypto? Is there any? You know, I think from our experience as an administrator we we and we we see all over the place we we see we see the traditional two and twenty but what we what we sometimes see more of is a lower management fee and a higher performance fee um and and as well with high watermarks hurdles all that uh, again it's varying fund by fund um but where most of the funds we're seeing you know do have a high watermark obviously that investors need to you know they don't pay performance fee until they've made money and any losses need to be recouped before they pay money um as well on hurdle rate we're, we're seeing some funds that have hurdles but um to traditionally not uh, we're seeing more that don't have hurdles than do mm -hmm. i guess from you guys experience what are you seeing in that um regarding fees we saw a lot more variation in the early days of crypto mm -hmm. funds. So in 2017 and 18, that's when we saw kind of carry at 30% and all these kind of different numbers in there and hurdle rates and the like. And then I feel like then kind of uh, everything coalesced around just the standard terms that you see really for non-crypto funds. Uh, one thing I'll, 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 I'll mention a couple of things for hurdle rates. Yeah, we rarely see hurdle rates these days. I mm -hmm. think people feel like a crypto fund, they're not really looking to like, they're not looking for something that's gonna track the interest rate, something, right? right? They're really looking for more like a home run, you know, like a venture right. capital fund. They're looking for something more of a home run than, you know, a steady 6% interest. I don't think, I think we, we, we all know that's not, not going to happen. Right, uh, I want right. to touch not on so many indexes points. as well, I assume, right? Not so many indexes to yeah. compare to or to outperform or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. I want to touch on staking impact because we do have some client that that is where we see some variety. And we've had, had some people not have a management fee, but and then keep all the income from staking. And then that's their management fee. Uh, so we've had some people do that, not many, but we do see that from time to time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, just from our perspective, it's um, uh, tallies with what you've said, Chris and Gary. It's uh, the the fee structures have uh, moved towards the traditional structures that we've you know seen in the non crypto space. So uh, two and twenty with with the high watermark in the open ended context is by far the commonest that we are coming across. Yeah. Um, there are obviously iterations to that, but I would say that is, uh, for lack of a better word, the, the, the standard uh, that, that that we're seeing. I guess in the in the sort of closed-ended space, it's it's a different structure, isn't it? With the yeah. uh, traditional waterfall, um, you know, twenty percent carry and um, uh, you know the uh, percentage return before they take their carry. That's due to the uh, due to the investor, the internal rate of return, and and th and that can vary. Great. And we did get a question about standard hurdle rates. So I think the answer is there really isn't a standard. We're actually not seeing many hurdle rates anymore. So um, yeah. you know there may be some funds that are still throwing a hurdle rate in there, but for the most part. Um, we're not seeing that so it's quite interesting i've got one out of asia actually which is which is a, a pending crypto fund and they want to use a hurdle rate i was a bit surprised by that but uh, okay they, so some are still using them but yeah it's a little bit i wouldn't more say some i would say one you know, few. Maybe. okay there you go one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then patrick, regarding patrick value, is it pegged, yeah patrick is it pegged to like s p return or is it a stat like eight percent or something like that uh, we, we we haven't got we haven't got to that stage yet, Gary. We're still in the uh, very initial um, uh, discussions, but I think it's going to be a percentage. You know, it'll just be uh, based on yeah. some some percentage. Yeah. 
And then regarding valuation, obviously, administrator is heavily involved in the valuation. Um, many of you may have seen that FASB here in the U.S. has come out um, noting that crypto investments need to be valued using fair value. Um, uh, in all honesty, that's how we've been doing it all along. But it's very, very encouraging to see that the in, that the FASB board has agreed with this. Um, this does cut down on on any um the challenges we may get, but um, you know we've listed coin market cap here. Coin market cap is a tool that provides valuations um, that that administrators such as us are use, are are using. And generally, the the timing the timing is based upon um, you know 11:59 p.m. and 59 seconds on UTC. So essentially, close of business. Um, what you typically see in a hedge fund is you see closing of the markets. Um, because in the crypto world, the markets don't close. People are basically using the last second of the day um, generally to value. Um, so that's what we're generally seeing. And, and overall, the most important thing here, I think, is to ensure that you have strong valuation language within your documents when you're setting up, that it clearly outlines how you're going to value, that your administrator has reviewed that language and is comfortable that that aligns with their processes and procedures and they will be able to support. Um, you know, there's some intricacies here and there where, you know, maybe certain exchanges are used for certain securities, but that, you know, that's why it's very important to ensure that you have a very robust valuation policy written into your documents. Yeah, I mean, Chris, I'd just like to pick up on that. Um, uh, the uh, Cayman um, uh, guidance notes issued by SEMA actually require in terms of contents of uh, offering documents for open-ended funds and uh, contents of marketing materials uh, in your closed-ended funds. There's, there's a strong em emphasis on valuation and, and disclosing your valuation procedures and, and your valuation policies. and, and I think it's easy to um, ignore the importance of that, but it, it really is something that close attention needs to be paid to because uh, if there is an issue with the fund, that's something that's going to be looked at. So it's worth right. putting the time and effort into that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And then a question. And I feel oh, like. Go ahead, oh, go ahead Chris. Oh, just a couple of things for coin market cap. Uh, we too use that. I feel like the last three, four years, that's really been the standard. At first, there was maybe some alternatives for uh, mm. valuing tokens, but now we pretty much uh, use coin market cap, but we we rarely use spot. I would rather use trailing seven days or sometimes even trailing 30 days. Do you all see spot as opposed to uh, a, a trailing? Yeah, I, I think we're seeing generally spot um, for the most part. Yeah, I mean it's it's it 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 varies uh, in our experience. Yeah. Yeah, and then for valuation, Chris, does Formidium value NFTs? Um, we look for we we look for an independent source. So we do, you know, we we work with a manager. We don't we obviously we don't value anything, right? As an administrator, we look for uh, you know an independent valuation agent. So we will look at the values of the NFTs. We will try to work with the clients to understand it. It's similar to any fair valuation, right? So um, we understand that some NFT markets, uh, you know, valuations are artificially inflated by. Uh, incestual selling we'll call it um so it's important for us to work with the client understand the nft itself understand you know what they're seeing as a market whether it's mark up mark down and then getting comfortable with that following the fasb rules um in some scenarios we may need to involve auditors if we're not getting comfortable or if there's a disagreement between us and the client but it's generally um, working with our clients to understand you know where they see the value why they see that value and and finding a source that can independently um, get us comfort with that we have a number of clients that invest in the metaverse, buying non-fungible tokens and uh, getting an auditor is uh, is a real challenge. Yes. Yeah, become, I think, yeah, audit, audit has become a challenge for a lot. Um, some of it's staffing, some of it's um, understanding, but, um, but yeah, they, they're definitely, they've improved and they're continuing to improve. So I think that will, that will only get better. But, um, we did have a question about, 
where do we see the high water mark usually at? So I think that may be just misconfusion. High water mark is essentially the the value that the investor subscribed at, or the value that the investor was at the last time a performance fee was paid. Yeah. So that high water mark varies investor by investor, but it's essentially it, uh, you may be getting it confused with hurdle rates that we spoke about earlier, where a hurdle rate is truly a return that you need to outperform before you pay a performance fee. A high water mark is just simply ensuring that the investor is not paying performance until they've um, until they've made a profit. All right, um, open-ended and closed-ended. We've spoken a lot about open-ended and closed-ended. So um, just for everybody's attention, open-ended is typically what we see in a hedge fund world, right? Where an investor can actually redeem at will. Um, an investor is able to put in a redemption request. Closed-ended, a lot of times we're seeing more in private equity and venture fund where, where the fund has a, a, a quote-unquote lifetime or you know there is an expectation, there is a date that the fund is expected to redeem. Um, I know that these are used both onshore and offshore. We'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, Gary, maybe I can turn it over to you to some of the some of the other reasons why um, why open ended or closed ended may be used beyond just the obvious um, liquidity and 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 redemption terms. Yeah, sometimes even if the plan is to invest in highly liquid crypto assets, highly liquid in normal times, not when an exchange just bit the dust. Um, <laughs> even then, there might be a reason to invest in, uh, to launch a closed ended fund. So we do see people do that just to kind of avoid people wanting redemptions and the like. And for closed ended, for our crypto funds, we don't always see 10 years. So in the VC space, in the non crypto space, we see generally. 10 years with the GP option to have two more years in addition to that, whether it's one year and one, one plus one or just plus two. But in the crypto space, we do see shorter than 10 years. Sometimes we see mm -hmm. six, sometimes we see four. I guess okay. in general, we probably see five or six. Yep. And, uh, you know, someone might actually do shorter than that just to avoid investors, you know, hitting them up, you know, you know like, Obviously, now might be a time that some investors might say, "Hey, you know, I'm out of here. I had my uh, crypto roller coaster. I'm I'm done." And you know, and uh, to avoid that, some people do use closed ended, even if they're investing in in uh, assets that are generally liquid. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's that, uh, that, that's uh, interesting to hear, Gary, because our experience on the closed ended side is is very similar. I mean, four years is is um, pretty common what we're seeing um, and then I I don't know if, if we want to just talk about um, structuring on the open-ended side just making sure that you've got your mechanisms in there to defend the fund if there's an issue and, and this couldn't be more topical than what's happening right. at the moment um, you know if you've got an, a, a liquidity event uh, which means there's a squeeze on the liquidity in your fund and you're an open-ended fund, you want to make sure that you uh, can impose a gate or alternatively um, institute a, a side pocket, uh, which effectively is hiving off your illiquid uh, assets, holding them separately from the main fund and allowing the main fund uh, to, to continue trading. So I guess the messaging there is... Um, uh, liaising and speaking to your legal counsel, getting uh, a thorough understanding that the, the of the risks that you may face with your uh, strategy and what you're intending to do, and making sure that your your fund is able to uh, weather the storm, so to speak. And there's a bit of a balancing act there because you've got to take into consideration the expectations of your investors to make sure that you attract in the capital. Uh, however, right. especially on the institutional investor side, a lot of them will understand why you've got these uh, mechanisms in place. Right. right. Yeah, it's and... important to test those side. It's important to test those side pocket mechanisms to really like uh, everybody get on a conference call, carve the time out and say, well, what happens if this happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? And then go through like you do with the waterfall. I mean, can you side pocket 90% of the fund? Probably investors might not want that. So you need some limits on there. You can side pocket, you know, this percentage for, for that long. It's important to go through and, and test those because you could have some side pocket language in there that might not really do what you want it to do. Right. Yeah. I'd agree. And my comment was just going to be a lot of times clients don't think they need a side pocket 
until they need it, <laughs> right? So I'm, I don't need it. My fund's going to be fully liquid. And then, okay, yeah, it's fully liquid, but it's all at FTX, right? So, um, so we have right. those scenarios where, you know, it's a safety mechanism, right? So there, it doesn't, it, it may, you know, yeah, it may lead to some conversations you need to have with your investors, but it's a safety rec recommendation, right? And, and as well, Gary touched on, I mean, Patrick touched on gates, right? For those of you who aren't aware, a gate is essentially uh, allowing you as a fund manager to um, halt redemptions if you have a large percentage of your fund that's redeeming. So under you know today's current events, you'd likely want a gate in so that if, I don't know, more than five or more, per, more than 10% or whatever that percentage is that you determine with your lawyers come to you and want to redeem all at once, you can suspend those redemptions so you can effectively liquidate your positions and pay those redemptions and you're not forced to do all that you know within the one month maybe that your documents you know have for a notice period of redemptions or maybe even less than one month so again very important to work with your with your lawyers to understand you know those protections put them in place for you and obviously as well putting them in pay, place for your investors that um you know that the, the investors that forget to put in their redemptions don't get stuck holding all the illiquid while you pay out cash to those who remembered to put their redemptions in. Next time I want to touch on was legal entity types. Um, okay, I, I guess I'll start with you, Gary. In the U.S., you see, obviously, we have the LLCs, the limited companies. I think those are those are traditionally used more for the the um, for the open ended, but you know, it may vary. And then limited partnerships. Um, I, I suppose actually it varies. They're not used either way. But um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Are there any of these that you're seeing more more than others? Are there any reasons why people may use one over another? Um, what's the rationale? Traditionally, limited partnerships are the way are the way funds were uh, from kind of the uh, the start. LLCs came along uh, after that. LLCs didn't really get big until the 80s, 90s, and so on. I, I, I guess in the digital space, I, I do see more. Um, more funds as LLCs than I do in the non in the non digital space, and that's because for a limited partnership, the general partner has to hold all the liability, right? And there's kind of no getting around that. Obviously, we're going to have the general partner be an LLC itself, so you know someone doesn't wind up losing their house or their Bahamas resort or what 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 whatever they have in their name. For a limited liability company, that's really, you know, just like it says, limited liability. So the manager, even though we're, we're going to make the manager an LLC too, there's a little bit more liability protection there. The issue is uh, we would really only do an LLC for a client if all the investors are going to be in the U.S. If we have an investor that's outside the U.S., some jurisdictions, Canada, for example, they uh, don't really treat the LLC or, or they don't really know how to handle the LLC. It used to be more jurisdictions than it is now. Now okay. there aren't that many, but usually just to be safe, if there's going to be, if there's a chance of non-US investors who might be coming into the entity, not through a Cayman structure or anything like that, who might be actually in the entity. So there, because there are some people who are already exposed to US taxes and they might be okay investing in an LP. But if they're investing from France or somewhere like that, then we would want to have a limited partnership just to make sure that person doesn't suffer you know, any more adverse consequences than they're already going to suffer by investing in a, uh, in a, in a US pass-through entity. Okay. And Patrick, for the offshore, you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really sort of following the non-crypto uh, traditional trend, if you like, which is the, on the open-ended side, the predominant vehicle is still very much a, uh, a company, an LTD, a limited company. Um, and, and there's a distinction uh, in Cayman uh, between a, an LTD and an LLC. We have limited liability companies in Cayman. They're a relatively new vehicle, but they are not used um, extensively uh, in the crypto or indeed the non-crypto open-ended space. It's still very much just the straightforward uh, limited company. Now, on the closed-ended side, uh, the pendulum swings and the limited partnership is the, uh, is the preferred vehicle. Um, as Gary mentioned, your general partner has unlimited liability. So what we would tend to see is a limited company set up as the general partner and there's no economics flowing through the general partner. 
Um, so you may have a separate carry vehicle uh, in the structure, which 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 takes a carry. Uh, so if there is an issue and, and and the general partner is exposed to unlimited liability, well, it, it doesn't have any real assets to lose, so to speak. Um, right. So 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 that's what that, that, that's what we see. Uh, they, we do see. Uh, some companies, limited companies being used in the closed ended uh, side of things. And, and that's um, especially in Asia. Um, I wouldn't say it's thematic to Asia. You would still see the uh, limited partnership used in the Asia context, but occasionally you would get a limited company coming in as well. Okay. Great. Yeah. And we really don't see much difference between like open-ended and closed-ended, whether people do an LP or an LC. Usually that's not the determining factor. Okay. And I'll mention okay. lastly that the documentation is really the same either way. So it's yeah. not like from the US yeah. side, uh, right. if you do an LC versus an LP, it doesn't kind of save you. It doesn't save you a doc or two. It doesn't save you fees. It's still kind okay. of the same documentation. Right, okay. All right, U.S. regulations. Um, we have the Investment Company Act of 40, the Investment Advisors Act. Um, obviously, we, uh, I, as you know, we're seeing most of our crypto funds are 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 considered private funds, right? That are exempt under these. We talk to the exemptions as, as within these bullet points. Um, anything you're seeing that's, I guess, I guess, different from a crypto fund than than your traditional private fund that you see? No, but I'll mention here the idea of kind of tokens being securities or not. So all of these are are keyed on securities. So investment company act, if at least 40% of your non-cash assets uh, consist of securities in, in other companies, um, then there's a chance that you might be an investment company and then you might have to register on the investment company act. And that's really meant for mutual funds and the like. So yeah. most venture capital, most private funds are going to be exempt under 3C1 and 3C7. So some people want to make the argument that, hey, I'm not investing in security. So yeah, we have 40% NFTs and they're not security. So <laughs> we don't have to comply with this. And that's really uh, not, 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 not a good tack to take. I mean, both of these Investment Company Act and Investment Advisors Act, yeah, if you want to start a crypto fund kind of on the cheap and spend very little time on it and not really do any strings, not do a form ADB, then uh, okay, you can do that. But that that uh, incurs much more risk than the right. benefit that you're getting out of it. I mean, the the, the right. risk benefit there is just, just not there. It really weighs in favor of no matter if you're completely convinced and you're just drink the Kool-Aid and you think that every token out there is not a security and it's all a big kind of government security conspiracy or whatnot, it really, for these two acts, it really, and for Securities Act of 1933, it really doesn't make any sense to, to not comply with these. For the Investment Advisors Act, if your, um, if your AUM, really if your AUM is under 150 million, then you're probably gonna be eligible for some sort of exempt reporting advisor status mm -hmm. and yep. that entails filing a form ADV just the part one of form ADV which is a relatively straightforward simple disclosure filing you have to disclose who the, who the major owners of your fund are even some of the minor owners down to I think it's 25 percent uh, and then you, you have to disclose that you have to disclose which funds that you advise generally here we're talking about the investment manager you could have the general partner also be counted as the advisor, but usually you want the investment manager to be the uh, investment advisor, because if you have like three funds, you want to have the same investment manager for each. You don't want to have to do three a ADVs. So uh, really the takeaway here is that complying with these, I mean, you can see here for Investment Company Act of 1943 C1, uh, really just up to 100 investors if you're investing in all kinds of digital assets or are qualified purchasers, which is a supercharged version of the uh, really supercharged version of accredited investors. And then filing a form ADV and the like, those aren't really too burdensome. So it right. doesn't make any sense for any manager not to comply. And also the vast majority of investors who know the space, who are skilled investors, it would be a little bit of a red flag if, yeah. uh, if a manager took the position that, well, they don't have to comply with these. Great. All right, how about, let's talk a little bit about custody. So we know there's the SEC custody rule. Um, so Gary, what, how, how does this impact um, 
obviously we, 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 there's a custodian who's in the news right now, um, but how, how does this yeah. overall impact? You, you, you see, well, the SEC custody, it's really just for registered investment advisors. So okay. on the slide before we were looking at the mark of 100 million. So 100 million is difference between state and federal. If someone has an AUM over 100 million, then we're generally looking at SEC. If they're under 25 million AUM, then we're looking at state. Between 25 and 100, it depends on what state they're in. Generally, if you're anywhere other than New York, then we're looking at the um, uh, then we're looking at the state level. The private fund advisor uh, goes up to 150 million if you're in the purview of the SEC instead of a state. So if you're over 150 million and it's marked to market. So some people try to say, well, you know, we really just have 120 million because you know that's that's how much we have. But and then it's ballooned up to. 180 or whatnot, and they've told investors that it's now worth 180 and the like. So, and then trying to argue that it's really, well, it's really the 120 that everyone paid, can't do that. So it is marked to market. And then if you're in that space, then you have to be a registered investment advisor. There are some reasons, which uh, I won't go into now for time reasons, uh, where someone might want to be a registered investment advisor. And if they are, then they need to comply with the SEC uh, custody rule, client funds, having to be with a qualified custodian. Um, yep. The advisors have to either have a surprise examination or an annual audit by a PCAOB firm. And that second one is going to be very difficult if your game is digital assets. So right. usually you're going to have a surprise examination. And even if you're not uh, subject to the SEC custody rule, generally you want to tell people that you're complying with it. So a lot of people are like, hey, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're doing all we can to make sure that these are safe. We've got private keys in the light. We got taking advantage of cold wallets, and we're doing everything that we can to comply. One issue is with with DeFi and Web3 and the like, you might not be able to just custody it somewhere and keep it there. I mean, you're out there using it in the light, using these assets, so you might not right. be able to just uh, keep yeah. it somewhere and custody it. So that's yeah. that's um, takeaway. For the uh, right side of the slide there, I'll just mention that recently the SEC came out with some guidance. Uh, they came up with this idea of a special purpose, special purpose broker uh, for digital assets. And the SEC set out some guidelines. They said if brokers in the space, including those involved in funds, comply with these guidelines, then we would feel that they've done really all that they realistically can so it's not really the force of law yet it's really just guidelines and so that uh, as you can see there establishing po policies to make sure everything that you hold is a security um, make sure that it's uh, that everything is keeping safe there's a bunch of cyber cyber security and the like make sure nobody's hacking in and uh, disrupting those digital assets and then do you give your clients any type of recommendations on custody or you know should they should they truly be with a, yeah. with a with a registered custodian, cold storage? Um, you know, what do you what do you? Yeah, thoughts? yeah, it's always better to have somebody else to point the finger at. Right. You know, that's why people hire us to begin with, right? They want to point the finger at us if something goes wrong, and so we have the same thing on custody. You know, unless they're doing something where, like I said, where they don't really have the option to custody it because they're out there using these assets. Uh, right. But if they are, it's, if it's more of a long long short strategy or something like that, then we recommend biting the bullet, pay the money you know, use a custodian, then if yep. something goes wrong, you know, you have, and, and there's less of a, less of a possibility something's going to go wrong if you pick, you know, uh, a valid custodian. Right. Great. Earlier, we touched on special purpose vehicles. I don't know if there's more we need to talk to here, but uh, again, as, as Patrick pointed out, a special purpose vehicle many times is being created to hold one investment. Um, it's very popular for safe and SAFs. Um, Anything else you guys want to add? Um, keeping in mind our, we're we're running out of time, but anything else to elaborate on? Yeah. Um, we, we we see people use the master series structure here quite a bit, which can be used yep. for LLCs and you so see you might not have an SPV that's really just all by itself. You might have an uh, you might have a master that has like seven okay. SPVs, yep. Yep. seven series, like right. so that's used a lot. Okay, that's great. Um, and then USA Offshore, um, Patrick. What are, I guess obviously, what are you know, what are some of the things we, we've spoken about a lot of this already. We've spoken to some of the jurisdictions. We've spoken to legal entity types. Um, any anything else? Obviously, the offshore fund. We we've listed some of the requirements there. 
Um, an offshore fund requires FATCA CRS reporting, which is foreign tax reporting. They offer, they require money laundering officers. They do require an audit. Um, anything else people should be considering when they're determining whether USA versus offshore? Um, well, I, I know we're running short of time now, Chris, so I don't really want to go into this too much, but I think you've sort of highlighted the main touch points there, you know, um, just bearing in mind uh, from an offshore perspective, your uh, regulatory overlay, which uh, you've highlighted already, you know, the yep. AML aspect, uh, FATCA, CRS, uh, data protection aspect as well, um, getting your auditor in place. Uh, and from your side, Chris, getting the fund administrator as well, you know, you need to submit right. a um, uh, administrator's <laughs> consent letter to the Cayman regulator. Uh, and both your open-ended and your closed-ended funds are now regulated, uh, both in Cayman and in BVI. So uh, I think that's all I'll mention on this, given, our, uh, given we're coming up against the time. Great. I'll just add quickly that when crypto first came out, we were all looking at Malta and Estonia and Singapore and all these different jurisdictions. And I feel like kind of like the two and 20 thing, it didn't take long till everyone really just focused on Cayman BVI. So yeah. we don't okay. really see anything other than Cayman BVI on the offshore side. We haven't seen that for, for a while. Agreed. And then of course, to toot all our own horns, the importance of using experienced service providers, right? So I, I think we've spoken a lot about obviously legal counsel, the importance of legal counsel without having people who, who know this crypto world, who know the environment that, you know, they're not, you, they're not gonna be able to address the risks that need to be in your PPM. They may not be able to, to address it. Um, similarly with a custodian, you know, using an experienced custodian um, will lead to, you know, will will allow you to, be in a better shape when it comes to operational due diligence when you're talking with your investors about how your assets are custodied you can you know you can speak to them that they are being held at a, at a custodian that's recognized um, for your offshore funds and as well as for onshore you know independent directors i think for the offshore fund we as administrator we prefer those funds that do have independent directors that are located within the jurisdiction of the fund um, so if you have a cayman fund um, we like to see Cayman independent directors. If you have a BVI fund, we like to see BVI independent directors. That way, we're comfortable that one, you have, you, you may already have legal counsel in those local jurisdictions, but now you have another resource um, that will support you. The fund will support also us as administrator when there may be um, questionable anti-money laundering stuff or any anything that's going on. You know, it's a, it, we like to see that um, the auditor. If uh, Cayman funds require an independent auditor, they require a Cayman sign off. So um, having an auditor, you know, we we as administrator, we have dealt, we deal with many different auditors. We deal with some audit firms who, uh, you know, know everything about crypto and some that are not so much. Um, so it's important to find an auditor that is, that understands crypto, that understands your fund, that is committed to getting your financials done on time. Um, you know, committed to doing some testing in advance of year end and getting themselves comfortable with that. And then, of course, administrator, you know, for Midium, as I mentioned, we we service over 700 crypto funds, um, finding an administrator that understands the crypto environment. Um, the environment of crypto is, it, as we all know, is very different from TradFi. As an administrator in traditional finance, you get feeds from the custodians, you get feeds from the brokers, you can automate a lot of stuff in the crypto world. Um, that's not always the case. The custodians and the exchanges many times allow for APIs to pull information, but none of these items, are, none of these, these firms are generally pushing information. Um, the protocols, the staking, the yield farming, all of that stuff that's done outside of a custodian or exchange, you need an administrator that understands that, an administrator that can sit down with you and, and really know what you've done, can understand your trading and can make sure they're comfortable that they can report it appropriately. The last thing you want to do is get to year end and have your auditors with, with a question on every single transaction that your administrator does not have documentation to support. Um, Gary and Patrick, anything else you guys you guys want to add on? On well, I think that this is part of the reason why jurisdictions like Malta and the like became less favored because people yeah. were having trouble finding appropriate service providers because no matter what they were told on the front end, at the end of the day, they had to like actually find people on the ground and it was very difficult. Yeah, agreed. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only point I would highlight there uh, is finding service providers who have knowledge of the space. Um, and you've mentioned why, Chris. It's, you know, there's um, a number of nuances uh, in the sort of digital asset crypto web three space and, and finding someone who understands what you're talking about when as a sponsor you're discussing it with them from the outset is very helpful. And once you're up and running, uh, it's it's um, very useful and, and, and almost necessary to have that because, uh, you know, otherwise you do run the risk potentially of, of getting yourself into uh, into a bit of a knot. Great. And we're just yeah, about out I of know time. On the legal oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, final thing I know on the legal counsel side, sometimes I'll get random calls from potential LPs and they just want to make sure the live person on the other end and they start asking <laughs> me questions about, you know, crypto experience and, and the like. So right. you, you, you need somebody who can answer those questions because you just never know. Exactly. Yeah. And we're about out of time. So I'm just going to ask one question that came up and, and sorry, we didn't get to all the questions, but what's the most common mistake fund managers tend to make when setting up fund structures? Um, okay, well, I, I, I'll give that a shot very quickly. And then Gary, you can have a go. But I think it's it's highly thematic at the moment is, uh, and I'm thinking more about the open ended side of things in the closed ended side is having a thorough understanding of your liquidity profile, a thorough understanding of the risks that you face or may face and making sure that your your fund is structured accordingly, because, you know, not just in crypto, but across all asset classes, the amount of times we've seen funds run into trouble uh, when there's been a liquidity issue, which they wouldn't have needed to have faced had they put more thought into um, this process at the outset or, uh, you know, listen to the advice of their counsel as opposed to focusing more on just getting the money in. It's, you know, this is a, this is a common issue and, and yeah. it can be avoided or mitigated to a very large degree if you do the work up front and you put the work, you put the thought in at the outset and you take the advice that's offered to you. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's good to have an anchor and when you're launching a fund, whether crypto or not, it's good to have a, either an anchor investor or some sort of trusted investment advisor who's really sitting on the other side of the table. Because sometimes, yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to, like Patrick and I said, it's good for the GP to have as much discretion as possible because you never know what's going to happen. And it's great for the GP to be able to, uh, to take certain steps. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes we've given the GP so much discretion that they go out there and try to sell their fund and nobody's interested, right? right because it's right. too, is kind of weighted that way. Particularly a lot of times people say, oh, I want something institutional investor friendly. And we tell them, well, that's going to be pretty LP friendly because institutional investors aren't handing their money just to uh, over right. to anyone. They have their own uh, criteria that has to be met in order for them to make an investment. So it's good to have somebody on the other side of the table when you're launching a fund to kind of give that perspective and to say, okay, well, I think we'd be okay with that, but not that. Yep. I think right. that that's important. Instead of having to like constantly amend the documents with every new negotiation with an LP, because that mm -hmm. kind of goes into like a kind of an endless circle where you're constantly having to change the documents. Great. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And thank you for everybody who attended. I know we didn't get to all the questions. We will try and email out some of the some responses to some of the questions that we've received back to the yeah. back to the attendees. Um, thank you all. I appreciate it. We and um, I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you on on some of our future webinars. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chris. It's been great attending this. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.